The Story of Civilization, Volume 5, The Renaissance, Part 2, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 5, Side 2. Raphael agreed with Leo in both temperament and taste. Both were amiable Epicureans who made Christianity a pleasure and took their heaven here, but both worked as hard as they played. Leo plied the happy artist with tasks, the completion of the stanze, the designing of cartoons for the Sistine Chapel tapestries, the decoration of the Vatican loggie, the building of St. Peter's, the preservation of classic art. Raphael accepted these commissions with good cheer and appetite, and found time, besides, to paint a score of religious pictures, several series of pagan frescoes, and half a hundred Madonnas and portraits, any one of which would have assured him wealth and fame. Leo abused his complacence by asking him to arrange fates, to paint the scenery for a play, to make a portrait of a beloved elephant. Perhaps overwork as well as love brought Raphael to an early death. But he was now in the fullness of his powers and the bloom of his prosperity. In a letter of July 1st, 1514, to his dear Uncle Simone, who art dear to me as a father, and who had reproached him for persistent bachelorhood, he writes in a mood of happy self-confidence. As for a wife, I must tell you that I am daily thankful that I did not take the one you destined for me, or indeed any other. In this instance I have been wiser than you, and I am sure that you must now see that I am better as I am. I have capital in Rome worth three thousand ducats, and an assured income of fifty more. His Holiness allows me a salary of three hundred ducats for superintending the rebuilding of St. Peter's, which will not fail me as long as I live. Besides this, they give me whatever I ask for my works. I have commenced the decoration of a large hall for His Holiness, for which I am to get twelve hundred golden crowns. Thus you must see, my dear uncle, that I do honor to my family as well as to my country. At thirty-one he was entering into conscious manhood. He had grown a dark beard, perhaps to disguise his youth. He lived in comfort, even splendor, in a palace built by Bramante and bought by Raphael for three thousand ducats. He dressed in the style of a young aristocrat. On his visits to the Vatican he was accompanied by a princely retinue of pupils and clients. Michelangelo reproved him, saying, you go about with a suite like a general. To which Raphael replied, And you go about alone like a hangman. He was still a good-natured youth, free from envy but eager with emulation, not quite as modest as before, how could he be, but always helpful to others, presenting masterpieces to his friends, and even serving as Messinus and patron to artists less fortunate or gifted than himself. But on occasion his wit could be sharp enough when two cardinals, visiting his studio, amused themselves by picking flaws in his pictures, saying, for example, that the faces of the apostles were too red, he replied, Do not be surprised at that, your eminences. I painted them so deliberately. May we not think that they can blush in heaven when they see the church governed by such men as you? However, he could take correction without resentment, as in the plans for St. Peter's. He could flatter a succession of artists by imitating their excellences, without ever losing his own independence and originality. He did not need solitude in order to be himself. His morals were not quite up to his manners. He could not have painted women so attractively had he not been powerfully attracted by their charms. He wrote love sonnets on the back of his drawings for the disputa. He had a concatenation of mistresses, but everybody, including the Pope, seemed to think that so great an artist had a right to such amusements. Vasari, after describing Raphael's sexual promiscuity, apparently saw no contradiction in remarking, two pages later, that those who copy his virtuous life will be rewarded in heaven. When Castiglione asked Raphael where he found the models for the beautiful women whom he painted, he replied that he created them in his imagination, out of the diverse elements of beauty present in different women. Hence, he needed a large variety of samples. Nevertheless, there is a healthy, life-enhancing tone in his character and his works, a unity, peace, and serenity in his career, amid the conflicts, divisions, envies, and recriminations of the age. He ignored the politics that were consuming Leo and Italy, perhaps feeling that the repetitious contentions of parties and states for power and privilege are the monotonous froth of history, and that nothing matters but devotion to goodness, beauty, and truth. Raphael left the pursuit of truth to more reckless spirits, and contented himself with the service of beauty. In the first years of Leo's reign he continued the decoration of the Stanza de Leodoro. By some whim of circumstance, and to symbolize the expulsion of the barbari from Italy, 
Julius had chosen for the second main mural of the room the historic meeting of Attila and Leo I in 452. Raphael's drawing had already given the first Leo the features of the second Julius when the tenth Leo came to the papal throne. The drawing was revised, and Leo became Leo. More successful than this vast assemblage is the smaller picture that Raphael painted in an arch over a window of the same room. Here, the new pope, perhaps to commemorate his escape from the French at Milan, suggested as topic the deliverance of Peter from prison by an angel. Raphael used all his compositional artistry to give unity and life to a story broken by the casement into three scenes. On the left, the sleeping guards. At the top, an angel waking Peter. At the right, the angel leading the drowsy and bewildered apostle to freedom. The radiance of the angel illuminating the cell, shining upon the soldier's armor and blinding their eyes, and the crescent moon whitening the clouds, make this a model pictorial study of life. The young artist was avid of every new technique. Bramante, without Michelangelo's permission, had secretly taken his friend to see the frescoes of the Sistine Vault before they were finished. Raphael was deeply impressed. Perhaps, with the modesty that still accompanied his pride, he felt himself in the presence of a genius more powerful, if less gracious, than his own. He let the new influence move him in the themes and forms of the ceiling frescoes in the room of Heliodorus. God appearing to Noah... Abraham's sacrifice, Jacob's dream, and the burning bush. It shows again in the prophet Isaiah that he painted for the church of St. Augustine. In 1514 he began work on the room known from its main picture as the Stanza dell'Incendio del Borgo. A medieval legend told how Pope Leo III, from 795 to 816, merely by making the sign of the cross, had put out a fire that threatened to consume the Borgo that is, the borough of Rome around the Vatican. Probably Raphael made only the cartoon for this mural and assigned the painting of it to his pupil Gianfrancesco Peni. Even so, it is a powerful composition in Raphael's best episodic narrative style. Mingling classical and Christian story, Raphael showed on the left a handsome and muscular Aeneas carrying to safety his old but muscular father Anchises. Another nude male, perfectly drawn, hangs from the top of the wall of the burning building, ready to drop. The influence of Michelangelo is evident in these three nudes. More Raphaelesque is an excited mother leaning over the wall to hand her infant to a man stretching up on tiptoe from below. Between magnificent columns, groups of women beseech the aid of the Pope, who from a balcony calmly bids the fire cease. Raphael here is still at the top of his line. For the remaining pictures in the room, Raphael drew the cartoons, perhaps helped even in this by his pupils. From these cartoons, Perino del Vaga painted over the window the Oath of Leo III, exculpating himself before Charlemagne in 800. On the exit wall, another and greater pupil, Giulio Romano, the only native Roman prominent in Renaissance art, pictured the Battle of Ostia, in which Leo IV, looking remarkably like Leo X, turned back the invading Saracens in 849, and in other spaces the able pupils painted idealized portraits of sovereigns who had served well of the church. In a final picture, the coronation of Charlemagne, Leo X becomes Leo III, and Francis I, here painted as Charlemagne, achieves by proxy his ambition to be emperor. The picture echoed Leo's meeting with Francis at Bologna the year before, in 1516. Raphael made some preliminary sketches for the fourth stanza, the Sala di Costantino. The paintings were executed after his death under the patronage of Clement VII. Meanwhile, Leo X urged him to begin the decoration of the loggie, that is, the open galleries built by Bramante to surround the court of St. Damasus in the Vatican. Raphael himself had completed the construction of these galleries. Now, from 1517 to 1519, he designed for the ceiling of one gallery fifty-two frescoes retelling the Bible story from the creation to the Last Judgment. The actual painting was delegated to Giulio Romano, Gianfrancesco Peni, Perino del Vaga, Polidoro Caldara da Caravaggio, and others, while Giovanni da Udine decorated pilasters and arch soffits with delightful pictures and arabesques in stucco and paint. These loggie frescoes sometimes used themes already treated on the Sistine ceiling, but with a lighter hand and in a homelier and more cheerful spirit.
seeking not grandeur or sublimity, but pleasant episodes like Adam and Eve and their children enjoying the fruits of Eden, Abraham visited by three angels, Isaac embracing Rebekah, Jacob and Rachel at the well, Joseph and Potiphar's wife, the finding of Moses, David and Bathsheba, the adoration of the shepherds. These little paintings, of course, cannot compare with Michelangelo's. They are in a different world and genre, a world of feminine grace, not of masculine strength. They are the sign of the light-hearted Raphael in his last five years, while the Sistine ceiling is Michelangelo in the culmination of his powers. Perhaps Leo was a bit jealous of the ceiling and the glory that it had shed upon the reign of Julius. Soon after his accession, he conceived the idea of commemorating his own pontificate by adorning the walls of the Sistine Chapel with tapestries. There were no weavers in Italy who could match those of Flanders, and Leo thought there were no painters in Flanders who could equal Raphael. He commissioned the artist in 1515 to draw ten cartoons describing scenes from the Acts of the Apostles. Seven of these cartoons were bought at Brussels by Rubens in 1630 for Charles I of England and are now in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. They are among the most remarkable drawings ever made. Raphael lavished here all his knowledge of composition, anatomy, and dramatic effect. In the whole range of drawing, few pieces surpass the miraculous draft of fishes, Christ's charge to Peter, the death of Ananias, Peter healing the lame man, or Paul preaching at Athens, though in this last the fine figure of Paul is stolen from Masaccio's frescoes in Florence. The ten cartoons were sent to Brussels, and there Bernard van Orley, who had been a pupil of Raphael in Rome, superintended the transference of the designs to silk and wool. In the short space of three years, seven of the tapestries were completed, and all ten were finished by 1520. On December 26, 1519, seven were hung on the Sistine walls, and the elite of Rome were invited to see them. They created a furor. Paris de Grassy noted in his diary, The whole chapel was struck dumb by the sight of these hangings. By universal consent there is nothing more beautiful in the world. Each tapestry had cost a total of 2,000 ducats, or $25,000. The expenditure for the ten helped to deplete Leo's finances and to induce the further sale of indulgences and offices. Leo must have felt that now he and Raphael had met Julius and Michelangelo in a battle of art in the same chapel and had carried off the prize. The amazing fertility of Raphael, greater in his thirty-seven years than Michelangelo's in eighty-nine, makes it difficult to summarize him justly, for nearly every product was a masterpiece deserving commemoration. He designed mosaics, woodwork, jewelry, medals, pottery, bronze vessels and reliefs, perfume boxes, statues, palaces. Michelangelo was disturbed when he heard that Raphael had made a model, and that from this the Florentine sculptor Lorenzetto Lotti had carved in marble a statue of Jonah riding the whale. But the result reassured him. Raphael had strayed unwisely out of his pictorial element. He did better in architecture, for there his friend Bramante guided him. About 1514, when he was put in charge of St. Peter's, he had his friend Fabio Calvo translate Vitruvius for him into Italian, and from that time he was an ardent lover of classical architectural styles and forms. His continuation of Bramante's Logie so pleased Leo that the Pope made him director of all the architectural and artistic departments of the Vatican. Raphael built some undistinguished palaces in Rome and shared in designing the elegant Villa Madama for Cardinal Giulio de' Medici. This, however, was chiefly the work of Giulio Romano as architect and painter and of Giovanni da Udine as decorator. Raphael's one surviving architectural masterpiece is the Palazzo Pandolfini, built from his plans after his death. It is still among the finest palaces in Florence. With sublime indifference, he turned his talents to the service of his friend, the banker Chigi, and built for him a chapel in the church of Santa Maria del Popolo, and for his horses, such stables, Stale Chigiane, in 1514, as might have served for a palace. To understand Raphael and Leo's Rome, we must pause for a moment and look at the egregious Chigi. 8. Agostino Chigi He typified a new group in Rome, rich merchants or bankers, usually of non-Roman origin, whose wealth put the old Roman nobility in the shade, and whose generosity to artists and writers was exceeded only by that of popes and cardinals. 
Born in Siena, he had imbibed financial subtlety with his daily food. By the age of forty-three, he was chief Italian moneylender to republics and kingdoms, Christian or infidel. He financed trade with a dozen countries, including Turkey, and by lease from Julius II acquired a monopoly in alum and salt. In 1511 he gave Julius an additional reason for war on Ferrara. Duke Alfonso had dared to sell salt at a lower price than Agostino could afford to take. His firm had branch houses in every major Italian town, and in Constantinople, Alexandria, Cairo, Lyon, London, Amsterdam. A hundred vessels sailed under his flag. Twenty thousand men were in his pay. A half-dozen sovereigns sent him gifts. His best horse was from the Sultan. When he visited Venice, to which he had lent 125,000 ducats, he was seated next to the doja. Asked by Leo X to estimate his wealth, he answered, perhaps for reasons of tax, that it was impossible. However, his annual income was reckoned to be 70,000 ducats, or $875,000. His silver plate and jewelry equaled in quantity that of all the Roman nobility combined. His bedstead was carved in ivory and encrusted with gold and precious stones. The fixtures of his bathroom were of solid silver. He had a dozen palaces and villas, of which the most ornate was the Villa Chici, on the west bank of the Tiber. Designed by Baldessari Peruzzi, adorned with paintings by Peruzzi, Raphael, Sodoma, Giulio Romano, and Sebastiano del Piombo, it was hailed by the Romans on its completion in 1512 as the lordliest palace in Rome. The Kiji banquets had almost the reputation that those of Lucullus had gained in Caesar's time. In the stables that Raphael had just completed, and before they were occupied by handsomer beasts than men, Agostino entertained Pope Leo and fourteen cardinals in 1518 with a repast that proudly cost him two thousand ducats, or twenty-five thousand dollars. At that distinguished function, eleven massive silver plates were stolen, presumably by servants in the retinue of the guests. Kiji forbade any search and expressed courteous astonishment that so little had been stolen. When the feast was over, the silk carpet, the tapestries, and the fine furniture were removed, and a hundred horses filled the stalls. A few months later, the banker gave another dinner, this time in the loggia of the villa, projecting out over the river. After each course, all the silver used in serving it was thrown into the Tiber before the eyes of the guests to assure them that no plate would be used twice. After the banquet, Kiji's servants drew up the silver from the net that had secretly been lowered into the stream beneath the windows of the loggia. At a dinner given in the main hall of the villa, on August 28, 1519, each guest, including Pope Leo and twelve cardinals, was served on silver or gold plate faultlessly engraved with his own motto, crest, and coat of arms and was fed with special fish, game, vegetables, fruits, delicacies, and wines, freshly imported for the occasion from his own country or locality. Ichi tried to atone for this plebeian display of wealth by an open-handed support of literature and art. He financed the editing of Pinder by the scholar Cornelio Benigno of Viterbo, and set up in his own home a press for its printing and the Greek type cut for that press excelled in beauty that which Aldous Minucius had used in publishing the Odes two years before. This was the first Greek text printed in Rome, in 1515. A year later the same press issued a correct edition of Theocritus. Though himself a man of modest education, Agostino prided himself on his friendship with Bembo, Jovio, even Aretino. In this last case, the Roman adage, Pecunia non olet, money does not smell, included a transitive verb. Next to money and his mistress, Kiji loved all the forms of beauty that art had fashioned. He rivaled Leo in commissions to artists, and led him a merry pace in the pagan interpretation of the Renaissance. He collected into his palaces and villas such quantities of art as would have furnished a museum. He seems to have thought of his villa as not merely his home, but as a public gallery of art, to which the public might occasionally be admitted. In that villa, at the aforementioned dinner on August 28, 1519, Leo himself officiating, Kiji at last married the faithful mistress with whom he had lived for the preceding eight years. Eight months later he died, within a few days of the death of Raphael. His estate, valued at 800,000 ducats, or about $10 million, was divided chiefly among his children. 
Lorenzo, the oldest son, led a life of dissipation and was adjudged insane in 1553. The Villa Chigi was sold to the second Cardinal Alessandro Farnese for a small sum, about 1580, and from that time bore the name of Farnesina. 9. Raphael, the Last Phase Raphael had accepted minor commissions from the Jolly Banker as early as 1510. In 1514 he painted a fresco for him in the Church of Santa Maria della Pace. The space provided was narrow and irregular. Raphael made it seem adequate by distributing in it four sibyls, Cumean, Persian, Phrygian, Tiberton, pagan oracles here sterilized with attendant angels. They are graceful figures, since Raphael could hardly draw anything without grace. Vasari thought they were the young master's finest work. They are a weak imitation of Angelo's sibyls, except for the Tiberton. Here the priestess, haggard with age and frightened by the evil fortune she is foretelling, is a figure of original and dramatic power. According to a story not traceable beyond the 17th century, some misunderstanding arose between Raphael and Kiji's treasurer about the fee for these sibyls. Raphael had received 500 ducats, but, when finished, claimed an additional payment. The treasurer thought the 500 already paid were all that were due. Raphael suggested that the treasurer should appoint a competent artist to evaluate the frescoes. The official chose Michelangelo. Raphael agreed. Michelangelo, despite his supposed jealousy of Raphael, judged that each head in the picture was worth 100 ducats. When the astonished treasurer brought this judgment to Kiji, the banker ordered him to pay Raphael at once 400 additional ducats. Be tender with him, he cautioned, so that he may be satisfied. If he makes me pay for the draperies, I shall be ruined. Kiji had to be careful, for in that same year Raphael was painting for him a delectable fresco in the Villa Kiji, The Triumph of Galatea. The story was taken from Politian's Jostra. Polyphemus, the one-eyed Cyclops, tries to seduce the nymph Galatea by his songs and flute. She turns from him in disdain, as if to say who would marry an artist, and gives the reins to two dolphins who pull her shell-like vessel out to sea. At her left, a robust nymph is gaily seized by a powerful triton, while from the clouds, cupids shoot superfluous arrows to encourage love. Here the pagan renaissance is in full swing, and Raphael enjoys himself picturing women as his bright imagination thought they should be formed. In 1516 he adorned the bathroom of Cardinal Bibiano with frescoes glorifying Venus and the triumphs of love. In 1517 he disported himself still more voluptuously, in designs for the ceiling and pendentives of the Villa Chigi's central hall. Here he adapted his genial fancy to a tale from Apuleius's Metamorphoses. Psyche, daughter of a king, arouses by her beauty the envy of Venus. The spiteful goddess bids her son Cupid inspire Psyche with a passion for the most contemptible man to be found. Cupid descends to the earth to fulfill his mission, but falls in love with Psyche at first touch. He visits her in the dark, and bids her repress her curiosity as to who he is. Inevitably, she rises from her bed one night, lights a lamp, and is delighted to see that she has been sleeping with the most handsome of the gods. In her excitement, she lets a drop of hot oil fall upon his divine shoulder. He awakes, berates her for her curiosity, and leaves her in anger, not realizing that lack of curiosity by a woman in such cases would demoralize society. Psyche wanders over the earth disconsolate, Venus imprisons Cupid for disobeying his mother, and complains to Jupiter that celestial discipline is deteriorating. Jupiter sends Mercury to fetch Psyche, who then becomes the abused slave of Venus. Cupid escapes from his confinement and begs Jove to grant him Psyche. The puzzled god, torn as usual between opposing prayers, summons the Olympian deities to debate the matter. He himself, susceptible to youthful male charms, sides with Cupid. The complacent gods vote to free Psyche, to make her a goddess and to give her to Cupid, and in the final scene they celebrate with an ambrosial banquet the nuptials of Cupid and Psyche. We are assured that the story is a pious allegory in which Psyche represents the human soul, which, when purified by suffering, is admitted to paradise. But Raphael and Kiji saw in the myth no religious symbolism, but a chance to contemplate perfect male and female forms. Yet there is in Raphael's sensualism a refinement and grace that disarms Puritan criticism. Apparently the genial Leo found in them nothing to reprove. Only the figures in composition here are Raphael's. Giulio Romano and Francesco Peni painted the scenes from his designs, 
and Giovanni da Udine added enticing enclosing wreaths burgeoning with fruits and flowers. The school of Raphael had become a transmission belt whose end product was almost certain to be some form of loveliness. Never were pagan and Christian so agreeably merged as in Raphael. This same worldly youth who lived like a prince and loved many women transiently, and, if one may venture such an anomaly, frolicked on ceilings with male and female nudes, painted in these same years, from 1513 to 1520, some of the most appealing pictures in the gamut of history. With all his guileless sensualism, he always returned to the Madonna as his favorite theme. Fifty times he pictured her. Sometimes a pupil helped him, as in the Madonna del Impanata. But for the most part he worked on this type of painting with his own hand, and with a touch of the old Umbrian piety. Now, in 1515, he painted the Sistine Madonna for the convent of San Sisto at Piacenza. A perfect pyramidal composition, the convincing realism of the old martyr St. Sixtus, the demure St. Barbara, a bit too beautiful and too splendidly gowned, the virgin's green robe, over a touch of red, blown by heaven's winds, the child quite human in his disheveled innocence, the simple rosy face of the Madonna, a little sad and wondering, as if La Fornarina, who may have posed for this picture, realized her disqualifications, the curtains drawn aside by angels behind the virgin, admitting her to paradise. This is the favorite picture of all Christendom, the most widely loved product of Raphael's hand. Almost as fine, and perhaps more moving, despite its traditional form, is the Holy Family under the oak tree, now in the Prado, also called La Perla, the Pearl Madonna. In the Madonna della Sedia, or Sejola, now in the Piti, the mood is less evangelical, more human. The Madonna is a young Italian mother, buxom and quietly passionate. Clasping her fat babe with possessive and protective love, while he nestles timidly against her, as if he had heard some myth of massacred innocence. One such Madonna could atone for many for Narinas. Raphael painted relatively few pictures of Christ. His buoyant spirit shrank from the contemplation or portrayal of suffering. Or perhaps, like Leonardo, he realized the impossibility of representing the divine. In 1517, probably with the collaboration of Paini, he painted Christ bearing the cross for the convent of Santa Maria dello Spasimo in Palermo, whence the picture came to be called Lo Spasimo di Sicilia. According to Vasari, it had an adventurous career. The ship that carried it to Sicily was lost in a storm. The crated painting floated safely over the waters and landed at Genoa. Even the fury of winds and waves, said Vasari, respected such painting. It was shipped again, and was set up in Palermo, where it became more famous than the mountain of Vulcan. In the seventeenth century, Philip IV of Spain had it secretly transferred to Madrid. Christ in this picture is merely an exhausted and defeated man, conveying no sense of a mission accepted and fulfilled. Raphael succeeded better in suggesting divinity in The Vision of Ezekiel, though here again he borrows his majestic God from Michelangelo's creation of Adam. To this crowded period belongs the St. Cecilia, almost as popular as the Sistine Madonna. A Bolognese lady, in the fall of 1513, announced that she had heard heavenly voices bidding her dedicate a chapel to St. Cecilia in the church of San Giovanni del Monte. A relative undertook to build the chapel and asked his uncle, Cardinal Lorenzo Pucci, to order from Raphael for a thousand gold scudi, an appropriate picture for the altar delegating to Giovanni da Udine the representation of the musical instruments, Raphael finished the painting in 1516 and sent it to Bologna, as we have seen, with a kindly letter to Francia. We do not need to believe that Francia was mortally stricken by its beauty to feel the splendor of the work, its sense of music as something almost celestial, its St. Paul in a brown study, its St. John in almost girlish ecstasy, its lovely Cecilia, its still lovelier Magdalen, here transformed into charming innocence, and the living lights and shadows on the drapery and on Magdalene's feet. Now, too, came some masterly portraits. The Baldassare Castiglione, now in the Louvre, is one of Raphael's most conscientious efforts, endlessly enticing, among his portraits, second only to Julius II. One sees first the strange fluffy headdress, then the furry robe and profuse beard, and imagines the man to be some Moslem poet or philosopher, or a rabbi seen by Rembrandt. 
Then the soft eyes and mouth and clasped hands reveal the tender-minded, sentimental, bereaved minister of Isabella at Leo's court. One should linger over this portrait before reading the courtier. The Bibiena shows the cardinal in his later years, tired of his Venuses and reconciled to Christianity. The Donna Velata is not incontestably Raphael's, yet it is almost certainly the picture that Vasari describes as a portrait of Raphael's mistress. Her features are those that he used for the Magdalene, even the Cecilia of St. Cecilia, perhaps for the Sistine Madonna. Here, dark and demure, a long veil falling from her head, a circlet of gems around her neck, and luscious robes wrapped loosely about her form. Probably by Raphael, but not so clearly representing his mistress as older views claimed, is La Fornarina in the Borghese Gallery. The word means a woman baker, or a baker's wife or daughter. But such names, like Smith or Carpenter, prove nothing of the bearer's occupation. This lady is not especially attractive. One misses in her the modest look that makes more charming such immodest revelations. It seems incredible that the modest veiled lady should be the same person as this bold dispenser of hurried joys. But after all, Raphael had more mistresses than one. Yet he was more faithful to his mistress than artists, who are more sensitive to beauty than to reason, can be expected to be. When Cardinal Bibiena urged him to marry Maria Bibiena, the cardinal's niece, Raphael, indebted to him for rich commissions, gave unwilling consent in 1514. But he delayed from month to month and from year to year the keeping of his troth. And tradition relates that Maria, so repeatedly put off, died of a broken heart. Vasari suggests that Raphael delayed in hope of being made a cardinal. To such an elevation marriage was a major, a mistress a negligible, impediment. Meanwhile, the artist seems to have kept his mistress within close reach of wherever he was working. When the distance between the Villa Chigi, where Raphael was designing the history of Psyche, and his mistress's dwelling led to much loss of time, the banker had the lady installed in an apartment of the villa. That, says Vasari, is why the work was finished. We do not know if it was with this mistress that Raphael indulged in the unusually wild debauch to which Vasari ascribes his death. His last picture was one of his supreme interpretations of the gospel story. In 1517, Cardinal Giulio de' Medici commissioned both Raphael and Sebastiano del Piombo to paint altarpieces for the Cathedral of Narbonne, of which Francis I had made him bishop. Sebastiano had long felt that his talent was at least equal to Raphael's, though so much less recognized. Here was his chance to prove himself. He chose as subject the raising of Lazarus and secured the help of Michelangelo in making his design. Spurred by the competition, Raphael rose to his final triumph. He took for his theme Matthew's account of the episode on Mount Tabor. And after six days Jesus took Peter, James, and John his brother, and brought them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. And when they returned to the multitude, there came to him a certain man, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and sore vexed, for oft times he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Raphael took both of these scenes and united them, with excessive strain on the unities of time and place. Above the mountaintop the figure of Christ appears, soaring in the air, his face transfigured with ecstasy, his garments made shining white by light from heaven. On one side of him Moses, on the other Elias, and beneath him, lying on a plateau, the three favored apostles. At the foot of the mountain a desperate father pushes forward his insane boy. The mother and another woman, both of them classic in their beauty, kneel beside the boy and beg a cure from the nine apostles who are gathered at the left. One of these is startled out of his concentration on a book, another points to the transfigured Christ, and suggests that only he can cure the boy. It is usual to praise the splendor of the upper part of the picture, presumably finished by Raphael, and to deprecate a certain coarseness and violence in the lower group, which was painted by Giulio Romano. But two of the finest figures are in the lower foreground, the disturbed reader and a kneeling woman with bare shoulder and gleaming drapery. Raphael began work on the Transfiguration in 1517, but had not finished it when he died. We cannot say how much truth there is in Vasari's account, written some thirty years after the event. 
Raphael continued his secret pleasures beyond all measure. After an unusually wild debauch, he returned home with a severe fever, and the doctors believed him to have caught a chill. As he did not confess the cause of his disorder, the doctors imprudently let blood, thus enfeebling him when he needed restoratives. Accordingly, he made his will, first sending his mistress out of the house like a Christian, leaving her the means to live honestly. He then divided his things among his pupils, Giulio Romano, of whom he was always very fond, Giovanni Francesco Peni of Florence, and some priest of Urbino, a relation. Having confessed and shown penitence, he finished the course of his life on the day of his birth, Good Friday, at the age of thirty-seven, April 6, 1520. The priest who had come to shrive him refused to enter the sick room until Raphael's mistress had left the house. Perhaps the priest felt that her continued presence would suggest on Raphael's part a lack of the contrition required before absolution. Driven away even from the funeral cortege, she fell into a melancholy that threatened insanity, and Cardinal Bibiena persuaded her to become a nun. All the artists of Rome followed the dead youth to his grave. Leo mourned the loss of his beloved painter, and the papal secretary and poet, the Bembo who could be so eloquent in both Latin and Italian, put aside all rhetoric in writing an epitaph for Raphael's tomb in the Pantheon. Ile hic est Raphael. He who is here is Raphael. It was enough. In the opinion of his contemporaries, he was the greatest painter of his age. He produced nothing equal in sublimity to the Sistine ceiling, but Michelangelo produced nothing equal in total beauty to the fifty Madonnas of Raphael. Michelangelo was the greater artist because great in three fields and deeper in thought and art. When he said of Raphael, he is an example of what profound study can bring forth, he probably meant that Raphael had acquired by imitation the excellences of many other painters and it combined them with assiduous talent into a perfected style. He did not feel in Raphael the creative fury that soon throws off guidance and cuts a path almost violently for its own way. Raphael appeared too happy to be a genius in the traditional frenzied sense. He had so solved his inner conflicts that he showed few signs of the demonic spirit or force that moves the greatest souls to creation and tragedy. Raphael's work was the product of finished skill, not of profound feeling or conviction. He adjusted himself to the needs and moods of Julius, then of Leo, then of Kiji, but remained always the guileless youth, cheerfully oscillating between Madonnas and mistresses. This was his blithe way of reconciling paganism and Christianity. As artist in the sense of technician, no one surpassed him. In the arrangement of elements in a picture, the rhythm of masses, the smooth flow of line, no one has equaled him. His life was a devotion to form. Consequently, he tended to remain on the surface of things. Except in his portrait of Julius II, he did not probe into the mysteries or contradictions of life or creed. Leonardo's subtlety and Michelangelo's sense of tragedy were alike meaningless to him. The lust and joy of life, the creation and possession of beauty, the loyalty of friend and lover were enough. Ruskin was right. There was now and then in Gothic sculpture and the pre-Raphaelite painting of Italy and Flanders a simplicity, sincerity, and sublimity of faith and hope that sink deeper into the soul than the pretty Madonnas and voluptuous Venuses of Raphael. And yet the Julius II and the Pearl Madonna are anything but superficial. They reach to the heart of male ambition and female tenderness. The Julius is greater and profounder than the Mona Lisa. Leonardo puzzles us, Michelangelo frightens us, Raphael gives us peace. He asks no questions, raises no doubts, evokes no terrors, but offers us the loveliness of life like an ambrosial drink. He admits no conflict between intellect and feeling, between body and soul. Everything in him is a harmony of opposites, making a Pythagorean music. His art idealizes all that it touches, religion, woman, music, philosophy, history, even war. Himself fortunate and happy, he radiated serenity and grace. In the arbitrary analogies of genius, he finds his place just below the greatest, but with them. Dante, Goethe, Keats, Beethoven, Bach, Mozart, Michelangelo, Leonardo, Raphael. 10. Leo Politicus It was a pity that amid all this art and literature, Leo had to play politics. 
But he was head of a state, and lived at a time when the powers beyond the Alps had ambitious leaders, large armies, and lusty generals. At any moment, Louis XII of France and Ferdinand the Catholic might agree to divide Italy as they had agreed to divide the Kingdom of Naples. To meet these threats, and incidentally to strengthen the Papal States and aggrandize his family, Leo planned to combine Florence, which he already ruled through his brother Giuliano and his nephew Lorenzo, with Milan, Piacenza, Parma, Modena, Ferrara, and Urbino into a new and powerful federation to be ruled by loyal Medici. To unite these with the existing states of the Church as a barrier to aggression from the north, if possible to secure by marriage for some member of his house the succession to the throne of Naples, and, with an Italy so welded into strength, to lead Europe in one more crusade against the ever-threatening Turks. Machiavelli, who had no prejudice in favor of Christianity or the popes, warmly approved of this plan, at least so far as concerned the unification and protection of Italy. This was the leading idea of the prince. Pursuing these aims with very limited military means at his disposal, Leo used all the methods of statecraft and diplomacy employed by the princes of his day. It was inconvenient that the head of a Christian church should have to lie, break faith, steal, and kill, but by the common consent of kings these procedures were indispensable to the preservation of a state. Leo, a Medici first and a pope afterward, played the game as well as his corpulence, his fistula, his hunts, his liberalities, and his finances would allow. All the kings denounced him, disappointed that he would not behave like a saint. Leo, said Guitardini, deceived the expectations conceived of him at his accession, since he appeared to be endowed with greater prudence, but with much less goodness than all had imagined. For a long time his enemies thought that his Machiavellian subtlety was due to the influence of his cousin Giulio, the future Clement VII, or to Cardinal Bibiena. But as events matured it became clear that they had to deal with Leo himself, not a lion but a fox, suave and slippery, cunning and incalculable, grasping and devious, sometimes frightened and often hesitant, but in the last resort capable of decision, resolution, and persistent policy. Let us leave his relations with the Transalpine states to a later chapter, confine ourselves here to Italian affairs, and deal with these summarily, for the art of Leo's time is much more a living thing than its politics. This book is continued on Cassette 6, Side 1.